our children. Yes, that's right. So welcome everyone to Better Young Missionary Congregation. Welcome those on YouTube also and Facebook. Now, have you noticed how uh, nature is reacting lately and especially the weather? Yeah. You know, just this past week we read titles like Entire Australian State down, uh, Now in Drought. Okay, another says the largest wildfire ever recorded in California. One reporter said, actually, it looks like hell. You know? Another headline reads, scientists predict more increase in heat wave death as world worms, right? Here in the province of Quebec, Quebec actually 70 died in July, last July, right, of heat wave. Another title tells us that scientists are, are warned, uh, or warned us that future heat waves will be more frequent, more intense, and will last much longer. And back in June, if you remember, while the world was focusing on the on 13 men trapped, young men trapped in cave in Thailand, and thank God for their rescue, you know, at the same time, about 225 people died in floods and mudslides in Japan, right? Is God trying to tell us something? You know, well, well in the scriptures, he promises that, he says that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease however in bible history when god wants to attract our attention the attention of the people he allows nature to be shaken so that man can look up to him this is what he did to the northern tribes of israel before it was completely destroyed by the assyrian in chapter 4 of the book of Amos, he lists all these calamities. They were experiencing famine, natural disaster, diseases, wars. And after each one, and five times, he repeated the same phrase. Yet you have not written to me. Yet you have not written to me. He did the same thing with to Judah. Before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, he called on them by, by shaking everything around them. Because he wanted them to look to their creator in prayer and in repentance. This is what heaven expects of men. And you know, right after listing all these warnings in Amos, we read the, these powerful words. He says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who, who, who declares to men what is, his thoughts is, are, and makes the morning darkness, the Lord God of hosts is his name. And to all, he says, prepare to meet your God. We know, we, we, we feel that the Lord is coming very soon. God does not take pleasure in such calamities. History tells us that if he allows them, it is because he wants men to turn to him and realize that this world actually is not heading towards, uh, what? Harmony. It's heading towards wars before the harmony comes. Perhaps we should begin to use the weather and these natural disturbances to speak about God. As he said in Amos, he who forms mountains and creates the winds is in charge of all these things. So he's calling us. He wants to attract our attention. And in our text today, it also contains some important information about the end time, what happens before these end times. There the Spirit addresses the believers who were concerned about the times preceding the coming of the Lord and especially the tribulation time. They knew about the great calamities and wars prophesied by the prophets of old, even by Yeshua himself in the gospel. Their question was, are we going through these things? Are we going through the tribulation? They already knew about the rapture, but they could not figure out if it was before, in the middle, or after the tribulation, Paul clarifies these things in actually 2 Thessalonians. Let's open our scriptures to this book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And see how it starts. Right in the first verses, he begins to answer their question. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. The word shaken, as we have seen, is the same word used for earthquakes or when a sea is in commotion. And so Paul begins here by telling them not to worry or be shaken about news concerning the day of the Lord or the tribulation. And then he proceeds to tell them that they cannot possibly be present during that time. 
He already told them in the first letter that the believers' preparation for the coming of the Lord is what? Your sanctification. Not for, to be prepared for wars or calamities, spoken particularly in the book of Revelation. The believer as well needs to prepare to meet the Lord. He can come at any time. Are we prepared for that? Furthermore, and especially, we ought to presently work hard to proclaim salvation to this world, to bless our neighbor with the good news of Yeshua. Why are we still here if our citizenship is in heaven? Supposed to be up there. We are here to speak about our great and wonderful God who desired that all men should come to repentance. That was Paul's advice in the first letter. Prepare yourself. Let the word see you so that they can come to see Yeshua. Now let us now look into this chapter, which happens to be the middle again, the middle chapter of the New Testament. And see how our world will enter the seven-year tribulation prophesied by Daniel the prophet and explained by John in the book of Revelation. Two things will mark the beginning of the tribulation, as Paul says in verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The apostasy and the man of sin. We've looked already at the apostasy. We traced it, we traced its history through the seven churches of Revelation. The last of which, Laodicea. Jesus spews it out of his mouth. This is the first indication that the church, the true church of God, will not go through the tribulation because Yeshua will never spew out his body. He cannot do that. But this last church, which is described as the abomination of the earth in Revelation 17, will be composed of not only non believers, but it will ha have been invaded by aggressive deniers of God and his word. We're starting to see these things. So the true congregation of God needs to be removed before the final apostasy occurs. Once this is done, we are told that 144,000 Jews and the two prophets will take over the evangelism of this earth. And they will be very successful. Now Paul's second argument about why the body of the Messiah will not undergo the tribulation is very powerful. Let us follow him in the text. In verse 3, he gives two descriptive titles to this world leader who will come and cause the last words. The man of sin and the son of perdition. Man of sin. For this man will personify sin in its fullness. Because he goes as far, would you believe, to pretend that he's God. I, I don't think that pride and arrogance can go beyond this point. We read in verse 4. That he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. This is again the ultimate arrogance. And it is, it is his very thing. His dad. His father. Right? The devil pretended he was when he fell. Do you remember his history as given by Isaiah 14? When he says, I will ascend above the heights of, of, of God, that is, and I will be like the Most High, right? At the tribulation, when he sits on the, on the temple of God, he publicly proclaims that he's God. It will be his moment of glory, finally, so he thinks. But he mis misinterprets the patience of God, who, right in verse 7, look what he says. That Yeshua will consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. His glory will not last. This fallen angel's glory. And notice, by the way, that Yeshua doesn't fight against him. He doesn't make war against him. The verse tells us that the devil will be destroyed just by Yeshua's glorious presence. Who can stand in front of God's glorious presence? He will be destroyed by the brightness of his glory and also be consumed away just by his breath. By his breath. John also mentions these two elements, right? When he, he, he saw Yeshua all glorified in Revelation 1. He says, out of his mouth went out a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. 
He will consume the enemy with the breath of his mouth, which here is described as a sharp two-edged sword. And you know what the sharp two-edged sword is? The word of God, Hebrews 4.12. See that we know the end of evil before the evil one proclaims that he is God. There's nothing to fear, right? The church fathers, Chrysostom, Hilary of Poitiers, and others translated well this last title. He says, the son of perdition. They said he's the son of the devil. The firstborn of the devil. This is how they translated these things. Now let us go further and see what he will do. Let us read again verse 4. He says, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. See that he sits as God in where? The temple of God. This is in relation to the physical temple of God that is about to be rebuilt in Israel. Today there's literally a national desire to have this temple rebuilt. It is in the Jewish people daily prayer. Even the secular Jews want it, either because they believe it will represent a center of gathering for all Jews or that it's good for tourism. But the desire is there and spread out among all the communities out there. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's not so much that, that he wants to sit at the temple, okay, as much as the temple is in Jerusalem. And the temple and Jerusalem represent actually the place where Yeshua is going to come back and establish his own temple. And later on where God's going to bring out his city. The city called the New Jerusalem down to this very place. Right? Now we can understand where he's so adamant in wanting to sit there so that actually nothing will happen. He will stop, let's say, the, the decrees of God. He's dreaming. And the means with which he will succeed in entering the temple are given in verse 9 and 10. The means by which he's going to lie to all this world. It says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 9 tells us that the Antichrist will need to resort to some magical tricks to convince the people. As Pharaoh's sorcerer did, when their stick also turned into snakes. But remember, Moses' snakes ate them all. He will use powers and signs. Now we learn in Revelation, by the way, that these signs and powers are mainly reserved for the false prophet who will be with him all the time. The Antichrist is more of a political figure, as John describes him in the first 10 verses of Revelation 13. But see where his expert, expertise lies. The last words of verse 9. Lying wonders. He will be such a good for, for you know what? He ends up to clearly state and believe that he's God. Okay? Really. I mean, how far can you go? That is, in fact, the wonder of lying. Okay, this is how the original has it. The wonders of lying, the miracle and power of lies. The word for lying, by the way, is pseudo. This is the word used for, for lying in the majority in the New Testament. He will need to lie all along because he's not God. And he will be so good at it that his coming will be the greatest deception the world has ever experienced. You know, I went to Google and asked the question, what is the greatest deception the world experienced so far? So the first thing that, that came out was a long list of, of uh, those Ponzi's. Remember Ponzi's? Th these clever individuals who convinced even very intelligent people that they could make so much profit for their money, they took the money and they left. The last most prominent one was Bernard Madoff. Remember? Do, do you remember him, by the way? Yeah. He stole, and listen to this, an estimated of $50 billion, okay? But among the victims were well-experienced bankers. You know, in the list you, you read uh, of the well-established Spanish bank who, who actually uh, gave him $3.5 billion to invest, an Australian bank, $2.8 billion, another Dutch bank, $1.3 billion. Right, and you have banks in France, Switzerland, Italy. I thought that these guys knew what they were doing. Right? Maybe we should take our money, put it in the mattress. I don't know. Right? 
you know, made of even took money from charity organization and Yeshiva University. And I want to tell you, scientists are no better than the bankers. They also are prone to believe a well-designed lie. Have you heard of the Piltdown Man? You know, th this might be the, the most famous scientific hoax of all time. You know, once a, a skull was found and believed to be a key missing link between ape human evolutionary uh, chain. So the hoax survived for 40 years before finally being revealed as a fraud in 1953. In fact, the skull t turned out to be nothing more than a modern human cranium attached to the jawbone of a monkey. Okay. Among the greatest deception Google mentions as well is Henrik Scone. I don't know if you heard about this man, a prestigious, that is, advanced electronic expert who, in between 2000, year 2000 and 2001, published seven papers in, in important journals. He received several prizes in physics, right? However, things changed when some started to question his data, and in 2002, a committee found that he had invented much of his result, not once, 16 times, and they believed him. They believed him, right? A similar phenomenon will occur when the Antichrist will enter the world scene. Those very experienced, well-educated people will fall for him. I want to tell you, Madoff and, and Scorn are no Antichrist at all. The son of perdition, we read in verse 9, will act directly under Satan. If one person will be completely possessed by the devil, that would be this man. His first lie would be what? Peace. Peace. Like all those false prophets in the Old Testament, the New Testament, who proclaimed peace and safety when the enemy was at the door. Daniel tells us that the first thing he will do is sign a covenant of peace. You know, you know how Isaiah called this covenant two times? Covenant of death. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, tells us that he comes on a white horse like Jesus, right? And he carries a bow, a bow, you know. His bow, or his rainbow, for this is the same word in the Greek, reminds us of God's rainbow in Genesis. The same word is used in the Septuagint to describe God's covenant of peace and protection to men symbolized by the rainbow. So he mimics. He mimics. The whole system behind evil is one of mimicry, or of imitation. Paul already told us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. When they say peace and safety, what happens? Sudden destruction comes upon them. Right? And they shall not escape. And these are the words of Yeshua. Same words in Matthew 24. And the time is ripe. Today, the time is right for this man to enter the world scene. Have you noticed those recent efforts for world peace? The, the peace treaty between North Korea and the U.S. Is it really a peace treaty? Do you believe that? No. And we heard last week that the U.S. wants to talk with Iran. Nah, Ezekiel told us they're going to attack anyway, right? On the other side, Israel, you know, that are good friends with Russia. You know, they, when they see each other, you know, the two leaders, they embrace themselves. Uh uh, the Bible says it won't last. It won't last. See, man is seeking peace in the wrong places when God is also working hard to call upon them. Yeah, you know, do you remember the inscription at the UN building? I, I often think about it, right? They quote actually Isaiah 2 4 and Micah 4 3. Okay, and they say, they shall beat their sword into plowshare and, the, and their spears into pruning hooks and we're going to have peace. And They omitted the beginning of the verse. You remember the beginning of that verse? He, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, shall judge between the nation and rebuke many people. Then they will have that. Okay? Then they will have that. Right? They want to do it by themselves away from God. We're here to remind them. Right? We're the salt of the earth, Jesus says. We're the light of the world. This is why we are to tell them. You know, the entry of, of the Antichrist into our world will be like the story of the Trojan horse. Right? You might remember from history that the Trojans were, were attacking but could not conquer the city of Sparta. Finally, the Trojans decided to trick their foes by building a hollow wooden horse large enough to hold many soldiers. This Trojan horse was presented as a peace offering. 
He looked innocent and peaceful on the outside, but pride of the men of Sparta got the best of them. They accepted the horse into the city gates. After nightfall, the soldiers came out of the horse and captured the city. In the same sense, the Antichrist will come into this world as a Trojan horse. People will trust him to bring peace, but he will deceive all the nations of the world. Only, you want to tell you, only the Bible can tell you these things. Only the scriptures. Now, before we look into more, more indication that will trigger the tribulation time, we ask one question, by the way. Why is this type of information found in the book of Thessalonians? Why is there? Why, why were they concerned so much about the day of the Lord? After all, this was one of the first church. This is believed to be the first book, the first letter that was written. You know, we have last time saw that these new believers were literally assaulted with so much literature at that time, right? Of which the Apocrypha, claiming divine inspiration, but yet teaching things against the scriptures. This must have been the words, the letters spoken of in verse 2. And we also know that there were many itinerant prophets teaching four things. These were perhaps the spirits in the same verse. This covers the first part, the apostasy, which began then. But what about the Antichrist? What did they need to know in advance for him? Their times were such that it looked like the Antichrist could not wait, wait that is, and landed on earth. Let, let me tell you who was there and who proclaimed divinity. It was at this time that many emperors claimed divinity like the Antichrist will do. You know, in the year 30, just a few years before the writing of this letter, Gaius Caesar, known as Caligula, already proclaimed his own divinity. And furthermore, do you know that he attempted to have his image set up in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, like Daniel predicted at that time. So they must have thought, is this the day of the Lord? And Gaius is not the only leader to claim deity at this time. They got it as well from the political leaders of Israel. Herod Agrippa I, the king of Judah from 41 to 44 AD. The one actually who killed James and arrested Peter in Acts 12. He thought he was God. Now Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us a strange and funny story. It's a, so once what happens is that uh, one early morning he showed up in the theater dressed completely in silver. So theaters then did, had no roof, so I want to quote what Josephus says. He says, his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's ray upon it, shone out after a su surprising manner and was so re resplendent that all the people suddenly cried, you are our God, you are our God. Imagine the scene, right? And they started to pray to him and saying, be merciful, give us everything we need and so on and so forth. Right? Furthermore, on the religious side, there was a frenzy of madness about the coming of the Messiah whom the Jews expected and whom they believe will save Israel from the Romans. The same historian Josephus tells us that so many false messiahs showed up at the temple and proclaimed they were the one by performing all kinds of miracles. You know, this is the type. This is the type of news these spirits brought to these poor believers in Thessalonica. This is what they were confronted with. And in the same manner today, we are confronted with so many proclaiming divine revelations. They don't go as far as saying they're gods. That's reserved for the Antichrist. But they proclaim divine revelation and interpretation. This is the time to read the scriptures where all the truth is there for us. Now to sum up, who is the Antichrist? If you go outside the scriptures and ask, you will get many interesting answers. Just let me tell you, you know, in the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1646, they write, the Pope of Rome is that Antichrist, that man of sin, the son of perdition that exalted himself in the church against Christ and so on. I don't think the Catholics like that. So they struck back and came up with their own definition and said that the Antichrist is Luther. Right? They said that he is the fallen star, which permitted uh, in Revelation 9 to unlock the exit of the abbess. They even actually, with much ingenuity, pulled the number 666 from his name. Let's stay in the scriptures, right? Okay, let's stay in the word of God. 
So the Antichrist, what the Word of God says, that the Antichrist will be an intellectual genius. Daniel tells us that he will be skilled, actually, in intrigue. He will be a political, commercial, and military genius. We've seen this in Daniel. He tells us that he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and precious things. He will be a great speaker. You know, when you have a great speaker which emerges, you know, usually people just fall for this man. Find out who this man is and what he is teaching. We can have a pretty good idea of his personality by the many names given to him. For instance, Paul gives him unrestrained, unrestrained, the son of perdition, <clears throat> the living reproduction of evil. No man will be more evil than this one. Other titles in the scriptures are the insignificant horn, right? Not the little horn that's too cute. The Hebrew speaks of something that is insignificant, right? This is in Daniel 8, 9. This is heaven's assessment of this man. The willful king, he will do what he wants, what he wants. The wicked one and the beast, so fierce he will be that when Daniel saw the beast, he could not describe it. He didn't know what it was. By the way, is it not interesting that we have so much information about someone who is coming subtly hiding his identity, right? The Word of God will uncover these things for us. This is what it does. There's nothing like the information we have in the Bible. Anything we need to know about the future is enclosed and frozen in the Scriptures. Now, are the believers going to meet the Antichrist? Would a believer be present in the tribulation times along with the Antichrist? Paul is about to answer this question and in what I consider the most interesting part of 2 Thessalonians. There is one more thing that Paul is about to introduce to us. The restrainer. The restrainer. The one who, or, or the thing that now restrains the Antichrist, right? Who is it? Or what is it? Let us see how he introduces the restrainer to us. Verses 5 and 6. You know, I love to read my Bible, you know, especially because of verses like 5 and 6. Look what it says. In the middle of such important revelation, <clears throat> Paul throws a curveball, okay, as if he gives us this vital information about the end time, and then he says, you go find out the rest. Verse 5 begins with the words, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? No, we don't remember. We're not there, right? Okay. What did he tell them? Okay. And then verse 6 is even better. He says, And now you know what is restraining. No, Paul, we don't know. We were not there. Okay. What is it? What then is restraining? Okay. Why doesn't he speak plainly? Okay, on the one hand, he gave us such clear and concise information. We're really getting into it. And then you want to know the rest of the story? Get it yourself. Okay. And, and you know, because he doesn't tell us, okay, there arose so many interpretations about who the restrainer is. Even a few years after he wrote this letter, the apostolic fathers could not agree. And here, 2,000 years later, we're still debating. Let's review the different interpretations about the identity of the restraining. It's, by the way, it's very interesting here. Some, I believe, got it. And at the end, the answer may be right in the words that he uses. It's much simpler, perhaps, than we think. Of the many opinions, we can divide them into two categories. <clears throat> First, those who say that the restrainer is a human government. Okay, at the time uh, of the appearance of the Antichrist. And second, those who give the restrain, restrainer more of a divine supernatural power, like those who say it is the Holy Spirit or the church itself. As for the first one, the human government, this is what the majority of the apostolic and church fathers believed at the time. They thought that it was the Roman government for its Pax Romana, right? Which describes the long and relative peace and stability experienced by this empire, which lasted over 200 years. It was Cyril of Jerusalem, a pastor of the time in the 4th century, who explained that the 10th king of the Roman Empire will be the restrainer. Then the Antichrist will form an 11th kingdom. You can blame them, by the way, for believing all these things because the Roman Empire did bring peace to their world and so they thought it was the restrainer. The argument, 
against this approach is that human governments are good for men, not for the devil. They do not have the power to restrain evil forces for, for themselves. The government can be used by actually the evil. As for the second approach, and follow me because it's becoming interesting. As for the second approach, some think that the restrainer are the angels or one of them. Some today believe it is Michael the angel, referring to Daniel 10. And others said it is the fifth angel of the abyss in Revelation 9 who opens up the bottomless pit to let all these demons come to earth. The most popular today, and with many apostolic fathers as well, is the Holy Spirit as the restrainer. This makes much sense, but could it really be the Holy Spirit? How could the Holy Spirit be taken away when he's going to be so active in the tribulation time with so many, and I believe millions of people, who are going to believe? Now let us try to pinpoint the best argument by looking at the words that Paul uses. Look at verse 6 and 7. And now you know what is restraining that we may, he may be revealed in his own time. But the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. There are a few things that come strong out of this, these two verses. The first is that in verse 6, the restrainer is spoken of in a neutral, neuter, that is, grammatical gender. Not a masculine, not feminine. So it is a thing. It is an organization, anything but a person. However, in verse 7, it switches to, the, switches to the masculine gender. That is, he's also a person. Right? How can we have both the neuter gender and yet a living organism? J.C. Ryle, an early 1800 Bible commentator, very astute one, saw the difference and he says, he says, undoubtedly, the neuter pronoun here has reference to the church of God. And the masculine one has the reference to the Holy Spirit himself. That is very good. But again, how can the spirit be removed? There's one more word we need to look at, at which, which may bring us right to the restrainer. Let's look at the last word of verse 7. How actually what it says. It says, he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The idea that he will be taken out of the way is there. But the word out, because the word out is there and the word midst is there, tells us that it will be taken out. However, the word taken, used by Paul, goes much further than something that is taken away. The word is used 678 times in the New Testament, only twice translated as taken. The word used is not the usual word for taken. You will recognize this Greek word, genitai, which, come, which the word genesis comes from. In its simplest form, it means to be, to become. In the New Testament, it describes one who comes into being through the process of birth. This is what it says. It is even translated accomplished and fulfilled in Matthew 5.18. When Jesus says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is taken, accomplished. Accomplish is the same word. Obviously, it cannot be the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. What can it be then? Who then will be taken and accomplished and be whole at the rapture? Furthermore, the same word is translated three times as married. Married, like in Romans 7.4, when he speaks of one marrying another. Same word. Who is getting married to Yeshua, the Ecclesia, the church itself. This is what it seems to be pointing to. The fact that the only thing that is taken out really in the book of Thessalonians is the church. We saw it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Could the church be the restrainer? It answers all the qualifications so far. And this follows Paul's argument that before the coming of the Antichrist and the final apostasy, that church will be taken away. But the argument is not confined here in Thessalonians. It fits the whole context of the scriptures. Yeshua spoke of us as being what? The salt of the earth. The primary function of the salt at that time was that of preserving, of restraining from decomposition. 
This salt is a symbol of the believer for his presence restrained evil. One example is found in Genesis. Do you remember about Lot? The angels were about to destroy Sodom and they told Lot, get out of there. We cannot do anything unless you're out of there. Why did he say that? Because in Second Peter, we learned that Lot is a believer. He's a righteous man. They couldn't bring the, the, the fire from heaven because a believer was there. Okay, that tells us the believer must be removed before the tribulation. Okay, the presence of Lot prevented the judgment to fall on Sodom. In the same thing, in Paul, when he speaks in 1 Corinthians 7.14, you know when he says that the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband? How can a believer be sanctified, right, by a non-believer? Because we're the salt of the earth. We carry the Holy Spirit in us. Every time you enter a room, you bring it, that spirit along with you. And the Bible describes the congregation of God as what? As the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. This is when the practical application comes about. Okay? Whether one believes this thing or that thing, this is who we are. We're supposed to hold the truth and to give it to the whole world. The truth behind this is that, is that without the body of the Messiah on earth, there would be nothing to hold up God's truth. For the congregation of God protects this truth from falsehood. So we can paraphrase really 2 Thessalonians 2 7. It says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until the one is accomplished and removed. Right? For it will be at the rapture that we will be complete. We will be whole for our, as a, for our salvation. Paul told them in verse 6, And now you know what is restraining. Probably they knew it was themselves. Right? You know, it's yourself who is restraining. You don't have to look anywhere else. Just like a teacher wanting his students to remember what they were taught, and in our case, to put all information together so that the church will not, and learn that the church will not go through the tribulation. So if we are indeed the restrainer, there's no way we will be in the presence of the Antichrist. And again, the argument of 2 Thessalonians, we cannot be or go into the tribulation first because of the apostasy. The apostasy will occur in its, when it occurs in its full form. We cannot be spewed out by Jesus. And second, before the coming of the Antichrist, will be complete, married, accomplished before he comes. For now, like Paul says in Romans 13, 11, our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Meaning the rapture, again, will come very soon. You know, there's so much more in this chapter. We'll cover it next time. But to conclude, I, I track your attention to the title in the sermon that you have in your built-in. The title is not fear, but confidence. No matter what, all these things that we hear about the end times and so on, not fear, but confidence. We've looked into the person of the Antichrist and all which comes with it. But the believer is not to fear anything in the face of evil because we have the spirit dwelling in us. There's one promise, which is the verse, actually, of this sermon in your built-in, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from all evil. Right? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Paul says. Work out your sanctification. Okay? Bring in as many people or pro proclaim the glory of God to as many people. And so for now, in the meantime, we are the salt of the earth. Salt, again, is a preserver. There was a saying at the time which says, shake the salt of the meat and you may throw, throw it later to the dogs. The same thing with our world, right? Salt was also used as in sacrifices in the temple. The Lord ordered that every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. This was not as a preservative for the sacrifices were to be eaten right away or burnt. But its presence reminds us of the work of the believers here on earth as priests, as representative of the Lord to others. Salt also became a synonym for wisdom. In the Talmud, it's written. The term salted is applied to a man in the sense of quick-minded, right? Salt is used for healing, for cleansing as well. You know, the knowledge of salt was there for many years. You know, in Leonardo da Vinci's famous picture of the Lord's Supper, 
You know, Judas Iscariot is known by the salt seller knocked over because he accidentally knocked it over by, with his arms as he was holding the money. If you look at the picture, you've got to see that the salt shaker actually is on its side. And yet the Bible speaks of, of the salt as a covenant of salt, that is, an everlasting covenant. Now, one last comment on the word restrainer, catejo. This word is used seven ti 17 times in the New Testament. I would like to bring you to one of them in Luke, chapter 18, 8, 15, that is, when Yeshua spoke about the parable of the sower. There Yeshua spoke of four soils, which represents four types of individual who receive the seed, that is the word of God. What do they do with it? The first three did not do well. The first received it, but did not take long before the devil came and took it away. Yeah, did it happen to you? Then you preached the word the day after. The guy said, I had no idea what you're talking about. The second was so excited to receive it, but it did not take long before temptation took over and the person just disappeared. There are so many of them outside. Yeah, they're believers, but they're outside. The third received it as well, but the, the, the world outside took the best of him, and he also disappeared into the land of Nod. You know the land of Nod, the land of never, never land, that is. We don't know where they are. But see what Yeshua says about the fourth one. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it, the same word, and bear fruit with patience. The word keep is our word, kachecho. The, the, the same word used by Paul by speaking of the restrainer. The restrainer. The believer then is to keep the word of God, to restrain it, right? And to give it to others. Amen? Uh, let's bow ahead in prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, Avenu Malkenu. Glorify you, for you are the unsearchable God beyond every created being's comprehension. We thank you for your spirit of light who dwells in every believer, so that we may know you, the true God, and know Yeshua Mashiach, whom you have sent. He is the one who allows us to be able to proclaim and explain great mysteries whose answers are in your word. Heavenly Father, fill this place with your power and your participation, for we have offered to you our praises and our love. Heal those who are sick. Comfort the weary. Give us all the, the, the powerful joy from heaven so that we can be the salt of the earth and bring light and blessings wherever we go. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Beshem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen, amen. May the Lord bless you.